with liberty and justice for all. Please remain standing for a moment of reflection for our servicemen and women throughout the world and for all those who died in our community in the past month. Roll call, please. Mr. McGough? Here. Mr. Rogan? Here. Mr. Loscombe? Here. Mr. Joyce? Mrs. Evans? Here. Dispense with the reading of the minutes, please. Third order, 3A. Minutes of the Scranton Historical Architecture Review Board meeting held on April 8th, May 13th, and July 8th of 2013. Are there any comments? If not, received and filed. 3B, minutes of the Scranton Police Pension Meeting held May 22nd, 2013. Are there any comments? If not, received and filed. 3C, minutes of the Firemen's Pension Commission Meeting held June 26th, 2013. Are there any comments? If not, received and filed. 3D, Scranton Police Pension Commission meeting held for June 26, 2013. Are there any comments? If not, received and filed. 3E, Controller's Report for the month ending June 30, 2013. Are there any comments? If not, received and filed. 3F, Minutes of the Scranton Lackawanna Health and Welfare Authority held June 30, 2013. Are there any comments? If not, received and filed. 3G, Tax Assessor's Report for hearing dates July 10th and July 24th of 2013. Are there any comments? If not, received and filed. 3H, Minutes of the Composite Pension Board meeting held July 24th, 2013. Are there any comments? If not, received and filed. 3I, Single Tax Office City Funds Distributed Comparison for 2012 to 2013, received on August 1st, 2013. Are there any comments? If not, received and filed. Do we have any clerk's notes tonight? No, Mrs. Evans. Thank you, Mrs. Craig. Do any council members have announcements at this time? Uh, just briefly, two things. Uh, first of all, just uh, like to uh, wish a get well to my father who had emergency surgery last evening. He's at home doing well, um, surprisingly, for appendicitis at his age. But he, he's doing well, he's home. Um, and also uh, my wife who's recovering from surgery at home. And uh, the second thing to um, wish my wife, uh, I guess it's self-serving, but uh, a happy 43rd wedding anniversary oh. this evening. Happy anniversary. Thank you. Happy anniversary. Happy anniversary. And God bless all Her. three of you. <laughs> all three of you. You too, because you're going to be caring for them as they're recuperating. Yeah. <laughs> um, just one announcement. In, um, uh, the Northeast Suicide Prevention Initiative, I know there are representatives here today, but I wanted to announce it as well. Um, the Suicide Prevention Regional Walk will be this Saturday, September 7th at 9 a.m. Um, registration at the Lackawanna County Courthouse on the Linden Street side or you could register early and be eligible for a drawing for a special prize at www.northeastsuicidepreventioninitiative.org and um, finally I would just like to congratulate um, fellow Scrantonian and a neighbor uh, Matt McGloin um, for making the team of the Oakland Raiders so I know uh, he will make Scranton proud and we will all be uh, rooting for Matt is there anyone else? Yes. Um, on Sunday, September 8th, from 3 to 7 p.m., there will be a benefit for Dylan Salvaggio, who is a newly born infant of Pat and Carla Salvaggio, who's undergoing open heart surgery on September 24th. There will be a $10 donation at the door, uh, and included in the uh, cost of admission, 
There will be food, uh, $1 Miller Lite bottles, a 50-50 raffle, basket giveaways, and music by Mike Brace. Also, um, over the recess, I had the opportunity to attend one of the West Side Neighborhood Watch meetings. As some of you may know, they're on Thursday nights. Um, at the meeting, uh, they were planning on developing the former L.A. Lewis building on 1621 Washburn Street uh, into a community center. And they're having a walkthrough of the building on Tuesday, September 10th and Thursday, September 12th, both at 6 p.m. Uh, for the proposed neighborhood center. So if you are interested or if you live in that area and want to learn more, uh, feel free to attend. And that's all. Thank you. The Southside Senior Center will hold its annual pasta dinner and basket raffle on Thursday, September 19th, 2013, from 4 to 7 p.m. This dinner is its major fundraiser of the year and helps to support the many and varied activities that are provided at the Senior Center. Tickets cost $9 for adults, $4.50 for children under 12, and takeouts are available. For additional information, please contact Rita at 570-346-2487. Scranton City Council will conduct public hearings prior to its regularly scheduled meetings on Thursday, September 12, 2013, at 5.30 in order to hear citizens' comments regarding the proposed 2014 capital budget. And on Thursday, September 19, 2013, at 5.30, to gather citizens' input concerning the proposed City of Scranton 2014 Action Plan, which includes the CDBG Program, Home Investment Partnership Program, and the Emergency Solutions Grant, or ESG, program. The public is invited to attend. Further, the first reading of the action plan will occur on September 12th, followed by a second reading on September 19th. A third and final reading is scheduled for October 24th, after the 30-day written comment period required by the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. In addition, Scranton City Council will hold a public caucus with representatives of the Steamtown Mall on September 26, 2013 at 5.15 p.m. to discuss proposed financial legislation. And that's it. Fourth order, citizens' participation. Our first speaker this evening is Kathy Wallace. Thank you so much for this opportunity, and thank you so much, Mr. Rogan, for announcing our walk. And uh, Mr. McGough, you said hi to your dad, and I want to say hi to my mom and dad. They never miss this show. <laughs> hi, Hank and Rose. Um, but I do want to inform everyone that there is a new organization. It's a nonprofit. It's run totally by volunteers. There's no paid staff. And we're having our first walk this Saturday, September 7th, starting at the courthouse. And um, so far we have over 300 people registered, and hopefully we'll have that many more that day. It's for people who've lost someone to suicide, or friends, coworkers, families that are supporting them, or people in general that are just very interested in this um, terrible, terrible tragedy that seems like it's happening more and more. And I just want to say the, the response to this walk and our group has been absolutely overwhelming. People are just, just really so thrilled that we're having this event in Scranton and, um, and wondering what they could do to help. A lot of uh, organizations, restaurants, um, schools, the University of Scranton, Lackawanna College, um, they've just been just absolutely wonderful in uh, asking how they could participate. And so I just want to make people aware of that. So thank you for this opportunity. 
And thank you very much for making that wonderful announcement. Thank you. Thank you for knowing what you're doing. Yes. Thank you. Our next speaker is Anthony Pamelia. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. My name is Anthony Pamelia. I'm from uh, 225 Lake Scranton Road. And maybe that, that address, Lake Scranton Road, might jar your memory about a, a study that, th thanks to your uh, generosity, that you, that you uh, had done about the traffic situation on Lake Scranton Road. I, I carefully read it, and I'm hoping three things might happen, that it uh, becomes of official document for the council. That's number one. Number two, that uh, a cover letter is sent with it to the mayor asking for his response to it. And thirdly, that it be sent perhaps to uh, some council, the council members in Dunmore for this reason. I live right on the, on the border of Scranton and Dunmore. And I would say, because I live there and I see a lot, I'm retired, 99% of the truck traffic is going into Dunmore. So if I could, I'd go before the council in Dunmore, I would say, would you please do an access road through in Dunmore, uh, fix any kind of a bridge that's a problem in Dunmore, that's uh, forcing trucks to go through Scranton to get to their businesses. I notice quite a few construction vehicles going down Lake Scranton Road onto Elmhurst Boulevard, heading, I'm assuming, uh, out, through, out to Roaring Brook because there's development going on there. So, unfortunately, I see more and more truck traffic in the future because of the development going on along Elmhurst Boulevard into Roaring Brook. I am seeing cement trucks, logging trucks, construction vehicles carrying black, I think it's blacktop, and, and fill back and forth. I see trucks going down into the De Naples property. I'm not faulting Mr. De Naples property because percentage-wise, it's not that many, but they're big trucks, and they're carrying construction equipment. And my fear is, since I'm a fearful person, that eventually scrap metal will be going up and down on that access road. My suspicion is that because our Lake Scranton Road is so close to 307, that, and I used to drive a truck, not, not, uh, not recently, but you would take the shortest route with the least expense in gas and the least amount of time to get to your destination. So. When I was a youngster driving the truck, I would be driving to Green Ridge. And if there was a nice convenient route and there was no sign that said no trucks allowed, I would take that route because it was quick, easy, and very little traffic on it. So, uh, my fault perhaps, but there's no, uh, if there were a sign up, it might discourage the, the truck traffic. I don't know. But there'd have to be some kind of an arrangement with Dunmore for access or something. Otherwise, I think it's going to get worse. That, that's my feeling about it and my, my uh, judgment that it's going to get worse and worse. And I feel badly because I'm retired there and I wanted a nice property. Uh, in the report, if you have a chance to read it, it does suggest to keep the properties in the pristine condition they are now. The trees are along the side of the road. The road's narrow because it wasn't intended to be a truck route. We got so many trucks, not just the Naples trucks, all kinds of trucks running coming down. They're speeding. I almost got run over with a car there. I mean, they speed the trucks, motorcycles, ATVs. It's becoming a, it's not a residential area anymore. So that's why I'm concerned about what the council could do, perhaps nothing, but I hope something. I'm, I'm going to address it, Mr. Pamelia, under my motions this evening. Okay. So thank you for your time and uh, your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Joseph Burke. Good evening. I'd also like to address the same topic as Mr. Pamelia, Lake Scranton Road. The studies in, I read it, I read the conclusions, and it certainly does not support the notion that it, tractor trailers should be using Lake Scranton Road. If anything, it says the exact opposite. Or am I wrong? I imagine all the council members got a copy of the report. Am I correct? I received one. You received it? Yes, and I okay. read through and it. And the other council members did not? 
Yeah. I didn't receive it. We have I've a copy in our office. Well, we, the city did spend ten thousand dollars, and I think every council member should become acquainted with it, because as of yet, I believe it came out July 29th. The mayor's office has not issued any type of report on their conclusions, and they're the one holding it up. If you do read the report, you'll see that it suggests that bike and pedestrian lanes should be installed on Lake Scranton Road, that there should be speed bumps installed, that there should be truck, truck weight restrictions on Lake Scranton Road. As Mr. Pamelia said, that there should not be any trimming of the trees on Lake Scranton Road. It described it as an access road to Lake Scranton used by joggers and walkers. Not a road for tractor trailers. I realize that there has to be some local deliveries, but it's four tenths of a mile. I lived there, once again, I lived there since 2003. Nobody told me when I bought that land that I would have to be put at the convenience of anybody who was going down to the Naples yard. That's not a condition of buying a home. We were there before the Naples punched a hole in the woods to make the access road. And one other point. During the course of the study, only 5% of the traffic was truck traffic. The Naples are supposed to be landlocked. They weren't aware of the alternate road that was mentioned in the study, Elmhurst Boulevard. Their attorney claimed there was no alternate road. But during the study, they didn't run their trucks across Lake Scranton Road. Well, they didn't give their workers a vacation. Work, their business went on as usual, except they didn't send their trucks across the Lake Scranton Road because they didn't want the trucks to be counted. So that's the situation. The mayor has yet to make any declaration on whether he intends to enforce the ordinance that you passed. And I would consider that a slap in the face because I consider it as a taxpayer a slap in the face. The mayor was elected not on a platform of turning his back on the taxpayers and the, and the uh, citizens of Scranton. He was elected on his platform, platform of defending the citizens of Scranton. And if you won't de defend us in this particular situation, well, the rest of Scranton better be on the lookout too because if he sells us out, he'll probably sell somebody else out. And that's what's happening. We live at the convenience of an enterprise in Dunmore, Pennsylvania. They're going across an already documented, dilapidated road. That was in the study, too. The road is proven to be in horrible condition, but they're not going to pay to repair that road if it ever gets repaired. It hasn't been repaired in the last 25 years. So that's our situation. I realize we're in the hands of the mayor, but the mayor will not respond. Attorney Kelly will not respond. Attorney Kelly did not respond to my 15 phone calls offering him the evidence when he was going to make his decision about the ordinance. And then I got a letter saying, sorry, I didn't have time to return your phone calls. I showed you the same evidence I was prepared to, to show Attorney Kelly. Dozens of pictures of tractor trailers carrying huge loads going across the four tenths of a mile of a residential street. You wouldn't tolerate it where you live. And there's no reason why we should tolerate it. Finally, I'm going to repeat myself. We were there first. The residents of Lake Scranton established their homes, maintained their homes, paid their taxes since 1964. The Naples punched that hole through the woods in 2010. There's no reason why we should have to put up with this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And our next speaker is Thomas Simrel. I would like to thank uh, City Council for giving me this opportunity to speak a concern that I have. And I hope you can do something with it. When coming into Nayog Park from Mulberry Street, on the left is the Earhart Museum. 
Just past that on the left is the start of the walking, jogging trail. 792 feet further, signs are posted that read, walking and jogging trail. The trail continues past the tree house, around a large curve, past the building where snacks, food is sold, then into a path where cars, etc., cannot go. There are two five mile per hour speed signs, one by the building where snack food is sold and one behind the museum that cannot be seen from the walking and jogging trail. During the, pers during the course of a year, thousands of old and young people with their children, baby strollers, or dogs walk this trail. Some Scranton high schools Schools use this trail for competition runs. The people who use this trail for walking or, or running are not safe from the cars, trucks, and motorcycles that zip by at 25 to 30 miles per hour. Reasonable, reasonable speed signs should be posted and the cost and fines. If this is done, the people who use and love this park will be safer. I've taken this to other people to no avail. Uh, if you go up there when it's nice and warm, and if you take your kids, keep them close by you, because it really isn't safe. And thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Mrs. Craig, if we could please send um a letter maybe to the police chief um, requesting that when available officers can monitor that area and cite drivers who are exceeding the limit. I would think Although we no longer have a sign department, but um, it had been. I don't know if it was the rec authority or. I think they only have the uh, pool area. I don't know that they are okay. in charge of the entire check with Mr. Dewar, the entire Mr. park. Mrs. Craig, did you have something to add? Um, I believe that it's enforced by the police, so. I think that's about the best route. You know. Okay. Yeah. And I would think then if there's police enforcement, then it is the city's charge. Yeah. Our next speaker is Doug Miller. <coughs> Good evening, Council. Doug Miller, Scranton. Good evening. Um, Good evening. Before I, I do get into the business that I have uh, this evening. would like to uh, just briefly uh, take a trip back to our uh, July 25th meeting, our last meeting before we broke uh, for uh, the August recess. And uh, I certainly uh, didn't necessarily conduct myself in a professional uh, manner that night, and uh, particularly with my exchange with Mr. McGough, uh, you know, I allowed things to get a little personal there. Uh, obviously, uh, prior to that meeting, prior for that whole month uh, we were discussing the university issue and, and certainly it was a, a passionate issue, uh, an issue where you were either staunchly uh, in support of it or staunchly uh, against it. There was no middle ground. Uh, and obviously I made it quite clear I, I certainly didn't support the project and obviously to this day I, I'm certainly disappointed in the outcome, but that's besides the point. Uh, I do want to apologize for allowing it to get to that personal nature uh, with you Mr. McGough. Uh, certainly, you know, going back to my time on junior council, I, I do remember what it was like to have a lot of personal uh, statements uh, thrown in your direction, and I, and I didn't like that myself. Uh, so I can only imagine, I'm sure, for Mr. McGough, it was uncomfortable and certainly inappropriate, and I do apologize to you and, and your family uh, for allowing it to, to get to that level. Uh, certainly, uh, those types of things don't belong in this chamber. We're here to uh, conduct ourselves in a professional manner. And I do promise to, uh, to do that moving forward. Uh, moving on, uh, obviously we're, we're getting into uh, later part of the year here. 
Uh, obviously, when we come back from August recess, we, we certainly start to talk about a lot of things, particularly uh, the budget for next year. And I know we're going to begin discussions on uh, the state of the city uh, moving forward into 2014 and where we stand. Uh, going back and, and reviewing some correspondence that we've gotten from Pell, they've certainly once again recommended a lot of uh, unrealistic uh, expectations for us, uh, particularly the uh, tax increase that they suggest uh, over, I believe, 117 percent. I certainly don't feel that's something that's realistic right now. Um, but we do have a lot of questions that we have to start asking ourselves, and that is, you know, what, what is our plan moving forward? Um, how do we plan on addressing next year's budget? Uh, we certainly know that we expect to face some challenges that are going to carry over to next year. And what solutions do we have to uh, overcome those obstacles that we certainly uh, do face? Uh, we've yet to uh, determine where the funding will come from uh, for the uh, Supreme Court settlement. Uh, that's, that's a hefty dollar. Uh, we know we've reached out to some banks and, and, and uh, institutions to try to seek some sort of uh, package that the city can uh, hopefully put together that can come up with that funding. Uh, we have to ask ourselves, are we going to consider a commuter tax again? I know that was a very controversial subject uh, last year at this time. But I think that we're well beyond whether or not something's popular or unpopular. I think we need to start dealing with reality, and the reality is this may be something that we may have to consider once again. Um, another op option is uh, do we look into refinancing the debt? Uh, certainly some may find it as a solution that's just kicking the can down the road. But is it something we consider to try to alleviate the burden placed on the residents of this city? Um, do we consider this, or do we look at that? tax increase of 100 percent. I, I certainly don't think that's something that council wants to entertain right now. But we do need solutions and I'm hopeful that, you know, in the next three and a half months, uh, we do have residents that will come forward um, and offer some solutions and some suggestions to this council because uh, I think last year at this time we showed, we, we, we proved to everybody out there, a lot of the doubters and the naysayers that when two sides of government come together, you can accomplish a heck of a lot. And I think that's what happened last year is we, we saw a lot of uh, infighting in-house and a lot of people didn't think we'd be able to put a recovery plan together. And a lot of people didn't think that that budget would come together on time. So I'm hopeful that we'll be able to carry over a lot of that same cooperation we had last year into the, the making of this year's, uh, or next year's budget. Because I think that's very vital moving forward. Um, as I've said in the past, I think that it's very critical that the next council coming in gets involved. I know they haven't taken office yet, but, you know, they campaigned. They, they made a lot of statements along the campaign trail. And I think they should come down here and come up to this podium and offer their input because they're just as part of, much as part of this as, as anyone else because next year at this time, uh, they're going to be making the tough decisions. Uh, I think we also need to consider, uh, or we need to continue our vigorous pursuit on the nonprofits. And this is a, an issue that we just seem to revisit time and time again. And I'm hopeful that we can reach out and uh, work cooperatively with not just the University of Scranton, but all the nonprofits within the city and build a working relationship with them and, uh, and, and somehow get them on board with what we're trying to do here. Um, and hopefully we can come up with some solutions that uh, can make things look a little bit brighter down the road. I know it's, it's hard today standing here to think that that could happen, but um, we've proven that when we come together, uh, we can overcome a lot of uh, challenges. And uh, I'm confident that we can do that and we can do everything we can to avoid uh, following Detroit's lead. We don't want to head down that path. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Lee Morgan. Good evening, Council. <clears throat> good evening. I hope you had a good break for a month. Um, I think that uh, Mr. Miller's apology was really something that I think that was appropriate, and I appreciate uh, him apologizing to Mr. McLaughlin <coughs> because uh, I just think we all have to respect everybody, whether you agree or disagree. And I seem to come to this podium quite a bit and disagree quite a bit, but that doesn't mean that I don't respect the people that are. Uh, sit in your seat or in the mayor's seat. So, um, But I'd also like to say that I am very disappointed on the last vote the council took in regards to the YWCA. 
I think that, in my opinion, it showed a lack of vision, and I, I just think there were other solutions that should have been really looked at and would have been a lot more feasible than where that project's going to take the city in the future because I, I could be wrong, but I think the University of Scranton owns the building adjacent to that. And um, I think that their plan is to move into the downtown. And I think that by somebody saying that we're going to stay in the same footprint and just build another building and go up or do whatever we're going to do because it doesn't suit our needs, I think that we've opened a can of worms here that really could have very serious repercussions for the city in the future. Um, the other thing I'd like to say here today is I would hope that when the next council meets, um, after the election, of course, that uh, in my own opinion, I think that Mr. Rogan should be the finance chair. There's a reason for that. Mr. Rogan's a young man. He's been on council all these years. Evidently, Mr. Joyce, he's paid attention to the things you've done. And um, I just think that uh, as a young man in this city that's going to inherit this city someday, I think that he's prepared or should be prepared to be the finance chair. And in regards to the next council, I think that Mr. McGough should be president of council. And the reason I think that is that he was president once before. Whether people agree or disagree and talk about politics, I think he has the ability to lead the next council. And we're going to have three new members of council. And um, I think he's capable. Two. Just two. Well, two no, members. but I mean, but Mr. Rogan's <laughs> going to be reelected, so, well, then two. But I just think that, um, I just think, to be honest with you, that the, I think Mr. McGough has leadership ability, just as you do, Mrs. Evans. And I think that with the problems the city's facing, I think it's time to look at Mr. Rogan as, a, as an up-and-coming Scrantonian that uh, sat through the difficult times with this council. And he's going to be elected for four years. So evidently, he's going to sit with the whole council for four years. And I just think that it makes sense to allow somebody that understands how council functions and has worked with the council and been with the council through the tough times in the preceding tenure of council to come forward and be the finance chair and work with the council. And I think that a study hand that Mr. McGough can give council as having been the former council president will serve the city extremely well in the future. Because I think that that's what we need. We need rock solid leadership and we need people that have been on council like Mr. Rogan and Mr. McGough who understand the problems and the turbulent times behind them and the turbulent times in front of us. And it only makes sense. And then of course spending enough time with the new council members to bring them up to speed because I really think that the, the worst is still in front of us. And um, look, and I'm not going to take shots at the mayor. I think that the PEL made a lot of statements and had a lot to do with the, with the recovery plan and with the last budget and with everything that came about. And it just didn't materialize. And we just have to be very careful with what we believe the PEL to be presenting and selling to the residents of the city and to this council. And I just think it's important for the next council to have enough common sense to disagree with the PEL and hope that the new mayor, whichever candidate wins, will have enough of a backbone to stand up. Because to be really honest with you, in my own opinion, I believe a lot of these problems may be beyond the scope of this council and this mayor because of a lot of our solutions are in Harrisburg. And I think that it's time for our state representatives and state senators to come forward and find a solution because the PEL has been here a very long time and we've gone the wrong way for a very long time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dave Dobson. Good evening. Dave Good evening. Dobson, resident Good evening. of Scranton. Good evening. Uh, I would like to approach the bench with this. Uh, what I gave you is an article on the uh, water company rate hike and 
page number one uh, addresses a law that if the water company, PA American Water Company, buys up a utility, a sewer utility, they can include part of the price of the operation and so forth in your bill. Now currently they're asking for an 11% rate hike and it's uh, some of the money is going to go to outlying communities. Keeping in mind that some communities outside of Scranton are paying possibly as high as $108 a month. But they, they have 300 foot frontages to their house. So we have to have this huge sewer line just to accommodate uh, the sewer uh, disposal. And uh, it's, I find it really egregious. Uh, the horse is partly out of the barn, it gets biased, all these stupid laws get passed. And uh, it's just a shame, but currently it's probably only going to be three or four dollars a month. But what will it be in five or ten years? Thirty dollars? Forty dollars a month? Fifty dollars a month? Uh, on our water utility bill? And then uh, if your water's cut off, keep in mind that somebody from licensing and inspections might uh, stop by and condemn your home on top of it. So, because I know one person whose home was condemned because the pipes broke while he was in the hospital and he lost the home. It was eventually torn down. Also, uh, I'll have to address it next week, uh, PA tax. Income tax is going to be allowed to be retained by certain employers. Now they're talking about raising it to 4.2 percent and they're going to let the employer keep it? This is ridiculous. I mean, for a bunch, for the Tea Party, for how, what a bunch of little tigers they were. I mean, shame on them for these bills. They took the corporate money, they're backed by corporate money now, and all they are is puppets. All they are is puppets for the corporations. Uh, and I'd like to give a little pep talk. Uh, the, the language did get a little contentious. And what my suggestion is, is separate politics uh, uh, polite from ticks and put a long E in the middle and it becomes polite with the long I and uh, a silent E rather and uh, you know that's that's what we need here I, I don't come down here to beat up on anybody and uh, uh, call people names and I would suggest that people stop doing it and get your timeline straight. Certain people I've noticed come in here and speak and they blame this council for something that happened eight years ago or four years ago uh, or, or whatever. And it's not right. Get your story straight, please. Because you're not helping out when people decide not to run or that they're just tired of it or uh, eventually they could just tune out. Uh, one former uh, council member told me, I just get disgusted with how the, I get picked on and I vote against uh, what the people want anyway. You know, it's a former council member told me that. She, she got tired of constantly getting harassed. And uh, uh, I'd also like to go back with that water. Now, a few weeks ago, you were at a proposal on privatizing the sewer plant. Mrs. Evans, uh, and uh, believe me, Chris Kelly couldn't wait to jump on that. Now, I, I'm pretty sure that came down from the administration, and it was people from Dubai are going to finance our sewer authority and all, all of this. It was really, I, I couldn't believe that you would even think something like that. You were just reading off something that somebody sent in as a proposal. and. That's what this was all about with this law. And in fact, we're financing other people's. Uh, and just quickly, uh, please consider that uh, Steamtown, letter on Steamtown to our representatives and senators, that, uh, that they really need their funding restored 
because things are kind of rough down there. And uh, they cut them 10% two years in a row, and they're also subject to the sequester. So, I mean, these institutions get placed here, and, and uh, then the carpet's pulled on the funding. Well, it doesn't do us any good. Uh, we don't get the hotel filled, or we don't get the tax uh, money because it's uh, tax exempt. And also another thing with the Times was the parking authority. I have never heard once on anything with the parking authority, any article, that there was an unauthorized loan. And that's what the problem council had, was the unauthorized loans that didn't come before council. So if you people would uh, in a week or so consider letting me have your phone number because I attended a meeting on that water thing and, and it would have been great to have somebody from council if they could. You know, I won't keep you awake at 11 o'clock talking about silly city business. business. And uh, once again, Ken Cuccinelli gets the golden parrot uh, from, he's the attorney general from Virginia. He wants to make uh, anything but wham, bam, thank you, ma'am, in your married life, a, a one-year felony. And by the way, you probably won't have the right to vote or own a firearm or anything else. So, boy, Taliban cooch. <laughs> have a good day. Thank, thank you. you. Is there anyone thank else you. who cares to address council? Andy Spragley, Citizen Scranton, fellow Scrantonians. Good evening. I attended evening. a meeting here in this chambers about the school tax. As you know, there's a little legislation running down in Harrisburg about changing the way the schools are funded. Okay, I listened to their presentation. It was sort of one-sided. You have winners, big winners, and you have big losers. And that's not a way a tax should be. Every renter in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania would have to pay more for their food, their clothing, and everything else, and your wages, wage tax, if you so pay, without getting any reduction for the schools. Because the school tax is based on property, and the renter does not own property. And there's no way you're going to tell me a landlord is going to lower their rent if this passes. So they're going to get hit hard. The winners are going to be business and actually cities like Scranton. Because if the tax is taken away from the people paying school tax to their real estate tax, then that makes more money that the city can gobble. So that's one thing. Now the rest of us in the center that own property. Okay, I own property. Now, my school taxes are there. Of course, I paid them with my property tax. But when it comes to filing your income tax, you can't file it. So already, your income tax is gonna go up. Because unless you can counteract the money that you're paying for your school tax, you won't be able to claim it. And if you ever looked at your actuation chart for taxes, it goes up pretty good. Especially if you have an 1800 hour reduction. That's how much you would have to pay. Now you would have to pay on everything you buy and eat, except what the government says WIC. I don't know exactly what's on the WIC formula, but that's excluded. I guess they couldn't do anything with it without fighting the federal government. So that's in there. So, like I said before, there's too many big losers. And the rest of us, I don't even know if we're winners or losers. Because I guess in some situation you'll be a winner, in some situation you'll be a loser. Depending how many children you buy, how much clothes you buy, how much food you buy. All these things are there. And they guise it as helping the senior citizens. This is a deal to take away the school tax from the senior citizens. But yet all they had to do was pass a law saying when you hit 70, you'd be excluded on your primary dwelling for school tax. They could have done that. But instead they used the super views that they're using. And believe me, 
every renter should call up their state representative or senator and complain because you are the biggest loser. I'm sorry to say. It would be bad if the guy didn't say he worked on it for 10 years. For 10 years he's been working on this plan. And it's not a very good plan. It helps out businesses, true. Maybe the cities like Scranton would get some use out of it too. The center of us, I don't know. Like I said, that's all variables. But the renters would lose. Everybody living in a high rise that's living on a fixed income. Everything they buy is taxed except WIC. Now, their clothes are taxed. Now, of course, with the, the tax on the wages, of course, they're not working. But somewhere along the way, maybe somebody is working that's in one of them, thing, them pro, uh, housing, you know, at low income. They would be hit with a double whammy. So this is how it is. And it's going through Harrisburg. Whether it passes or not, I have no way of knowing. Whether they change it or not, I have no way of knowing. But this is not a good plan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, good evening, Council. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, when I left this chamber on July 25th, I had many emotions regarding the vote in favor of essentially retracting the historical designation of the former YWCA building and setting the stage for demolition of other previously designated historical buildings. Tonight, I will share my ruminations down the path to the sad conclusion I reached. We all had an opportunity to read the substantiation of the true historical significance of the YWCA slash Leahy Hall building, written by guest columnist and history professor Josephine Dunn, published in the Sunday Times. A quick Google search when this issue first hit the council agenda, provided the information that Dr. Dunn had received a grant in 2009 from the University of Scranton to research the records regarding Scranton's YWCA as part of an ongoing study of women's history in Scranton. So my first thought was whether or not the HARB had consulted with Dr. Dunn. Sadly, I'll never know officially because HARB minutes have not been provided to city council and a right to know request was ignored. So what we now know is that the building itself represented new topology in architecture, a space designed for the religious, residential, and recreational well-being of working women. And there are few sites in our city more intimately connected to the history of women's work building Scranton. Other historical, historically significant facts from that article include the first local business and professional women's association was formed in this building. Classes in language and skills increased their wage earning abilities. Scranton was honored as a site for this important campaign convention due to the labors of local suffragist Kate Ryan Chapman, who succeeded in convincing Lackawanna Senator to cast the tie-breaking vote in the Pennsylvania Senate supporting a public referendum on votes for women. Just about every women's civic and reform-minded organization held meetings in the YWCA spaces. The Civic Improvement Society, the Women's Club, the Parliamentary Law Club, the Century Club, the Florence Crittenden Home, which probably most of you don't even remember, which was for unwed mothers, uh, St. Joseph's Foundling Home, the Playgrounds Association, etc. I wondered why Mr. Rogan chose to ignore the relevant issue of historical significance and chose to make permit revenue and jobs for local workers the most important issue. I wondered why Mr. Joyce made this issue his first departure in my recollection from voting with Mrs. Evans. Was it because Mrs. Evans is a lame duck or was Mrs. Franis correct that he was promised support from the unions in his bid to be tax collector? Or was he promised either a job with the University of Scranton or with a company directly or more likely several links away from a university benefactor should he lose the tax collector race? Or did he really care more for the city revenue than for the history of women in this community? 
During the course of your recess, I also read many articles seemingly unconnected to the demolition of the YWCA, such as one stating, and I quote, the Alzheimer's Association reported 15.4 million caregivers provided an estimated 17.5 billion hours of unpaid care valued at more than $216 billion in 2012. I thought how crass and sad to reduce personal care provided to loved ones to dollars and cents. Why has the destruction of the former YWCA bothered me so much? I kept asking myself and God. One morning my, during my devotional time, several different scriptures came together a day after I had watched the DVD of your caucus with Harb, which had been provided to me by a friend. Two short sentences spoken by Mr. Mr. Moore lit my fuse, referring to the former YWCA building, which I believe he voted to add to the historic buildings roster, Mr. Moore said the building was insignificant, nothing more than a pile of bricks. This was my aha moment. Some structures are valued because they please the eye. Others are valued because of what happened within the walls that please the mind and soul. To me, the primary importance of the YWCA was the Bible study that occurred within its walls and the impact the scriptures had on women and its motivation to give and to excel for women. Today's culture appears to revolve not around the scriptures, but the almighty dollar. So the destruction of the YWCA is truly representative of the current culture, just as the YWCA represented the culture of its day. I'm pleased and thankful I was born when I was. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Is there anyone else who cares to address city council? If I could briefly address some of the uh, comments made about my vote in particular. I understand that there was a disagreement of opinion um, between me and uh, Ms. Schumacher. However, I can assure you that I have not had any contact with any of the uh, trade union individuals that have uh, come to the council meetings, nor did I have any contact prior promising me any support in uh, the tax collector race, nor was I promised a job or any type of lucrative position with the University of Scranton if I should lose that race. And I just wanted to state that for the record. Is there anyone else? Mrs. Craig? 5A motion. Councilman McGough, do you have any comments or motions? <clears throat> yes. Um, first of all, uh, at our last meeting, um, I was, uh, first of all, uh, I'd like to thank Mr. Miller for his apology. Uh, thank you, and uh, my family will be grateful for that. And, and with that said, I believe that Mr. Joyce is um, doing an apology. I think speculation about why he voted and how he voted and indications that he did something inappropriately I, I think is unwarranted, as I said at the last meeting. I, I think that that's, that's totally uncalled for um, at a public meeting. Um, and, and my apologies for that having happened, uh, Mr. Joyce. Thank you. Um, also, uh, I thank Mr. Morgan for his vote of confidence, uh, but uh, I, there's a whole lot of work that we have to do before um, January comes along, and uh, personally, I will be thankful if I'm here in January. So um, hopefully we, as a council, can get our work, get the work done be pr you know, prior to January and move into January. Um, with sort of a clean slate and move forward. As far as the two um, items that were discussed uh, at the podium, um, I would like to just reaffirm my support for um, truck restrictions at, on Lake Scranton Road. Um, from the beginning, I, I stated that uh, I use that road frequently, um, and it, it is dangerous, and it is not suited for the type, 
excuse me, it's been a long time, um, <laughs> for the type of truck traffic that is um, going across that road. And, and secondly, uh, the report that we did receive just reaffirms um, what was stated, that that road is in desperate need, and need is the key word of repaving. Uh, something needs to be done there, and with the, with the amount of foot traffic that takes place there, there is also a need for some type of, um, call it bicycle lane, pedestrian lane, something, because there are no sidewalks along that road, and it does get a lot of foot traffic um, other than people running, and uh, something really needs to be done in that um, four-tenths of a mile area. And uh, lastly, as far as the signage at Nayog Park, um, I'll contact um, Mark Dewar tomorrow and um, um, probably also take a ride up through the, the park just to see what the, where the signs are and what can, you know, maybe what we can do. Um, if there is something that a better placement of signage would, um, you know, facilitate, uh, you know, some safety measures there. And that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. And Councilman Rogan. Thank you. Um, I will be relatively brief tonight. I just want to address um, a few, well, one issue that was brought up that I wasn't planning on addressing tonight, which was the YWCA, which was brought up again. Um, I make no apologies for choosing, trying to help create jobs in the city and have economic growth. That's my position. We just disagree. Um, that's what I fought for. I, I'm glad the vote went the way it did. And I'm very thankful that this project will move forward. Um, next, regarding uh, the CDBG allocations, I will get in touch with Linda Abley to see what direction um, she plans on moving in. And as we have in the past, um, I'm sure council will be making amendments in the past um, one of the things I'm very proud of is this entire council has made a priority of using those funds for projects to benefit the entire community. Um, increasing allocations for road paving, which is direly needed in the city. Um, it's been increased, I believe, every year um, since I've been on council and since this council took over. Um, funding for blight removal, which is very important in our neighborhoods. Um, different items to, to help our neighborhoods. Some of the things that um, I fought for and many of us have to have removed out of there were more frivolous spending. Um, I believe in the past, tens of thousands of dollars were spent on tickets for to transport low-income individuals to Broadway plays and things of that nature, which is all well and good, but um, I don't believe that's an adequate use of taxpayer dollars. Um, I do have a few requests tonight, and one of them, I guess sticking on the theme of the night, because we were talking about truck traffic, um, this is regarding a stop sign on South Cameron and um, Washburn. And attached here is an ordinance prohibiting truck traffic having a gross weight of five tons or more on um, the 100 block of South Cameron and the 23 and 2400 blocks of Washburn Street. And it, um, that legislation is here as well as um, restricting the parking or standing of like vehicles in that neighborhood. Um, the residents report that the stop sign was once again ripped down. Um, it was put back up by the DPW, but not in the proper location. Um, Mrs. Craig, can we please let the DPW be made aware of the situation and as well as, and I, I know there are quite a few areas where um, truck traffic bans are an issue, um, this one as well for, for the police department. Um, next, the city resident called with a complaint about a house at 913 and 915 Einan Street. Um, they said the house was condemned in 2012. Um, there was an oil spill. And the, the complaint says that Mr. Seitzinger lifted the condemnation without a general inspection and also without um, having DEP inspect because of the oil spill. If we could please send this uh, to Mr. Seitzinger um, to have him let us know what's going on with this property. And finally, um, I'm not going to read the letter because it is a little bit lengthy, but there are multiple issues um, on East Mountain that different residents have had. Um, an issue of blight on Snook Street, um, the edge of the roads um, on East Mountain Road being covered with leaves and litter, um, the condition of the firehouse on East Mountain Road, 
Um, this is a wintertime issue. Um, puddles that become ice on Seymour Avenue, which can be very dangerous in the winter. Um, also, um, the stop signs at the top of East Mountain Road are, many of them are, are worn out and a lot of them are ignored. So I think this is definitely something that, that needs to be addressed. And, and I've, I've mentioned this before about East Mountain and West Mountain, that a lot of times these neighborhoods unfortunately get neglected. But when you look, actually look at the tax rolls, the taxes in, in both of these neighborhoods are, are higher than other areas in the city. So they deserve the same services as, as everyone else. So I will provide this as well. And um, I'll save my other comments for agenda items. Thank you. Thank you. And Councilman Loscombe, do you have comments or motions? Yes, just briefly. Uh, first of all, I'd like to welcome my colleagues back to court here. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the recess has given us a chance to get a little breather and probably a chance to uh, work on some family projects and get to see our families again. Um, and even though it was a recess for us, I know we're all still working on constituent issues. Um, and uh, as, as Mr. Rogan stated, the issue back at Cameron Avenue, uh, again, that, that's good. I'm glad you brought it up because... Uh, I was aware of that issue also, the traffic sign. I, I've also heard that uh, just today that there's a considerable amount of Colts bus traffic using North Merrifield Avenue, which oh, is... Oh, that's, that's going to be stopped. Okay. I think um, they're Because going of the Kaiser through, Avenue, yeah, but, but still it's a no truck through, route. But I believe um, Chief Graziano oh. was yes. going to contact Colts and... Um, you know, ask that the buses will proceed, I guess, on Kaiser. Correct. Rather than going down into the neighborhood. So that should be taken care of almost immediately. Yes, because I heard there was a, as much as 42 buses in one day just traveling that residential route. So it does appear we have issues on different parts of the city with truck traffic. And, and hopefully we'll get these issues straightened out and, and enforced. Um, I know it's, it's tough because our, our police department is spread thin and we, we don't have a sign department anymore, so I don't know how we're obtaining our signs at this point, but uh, that's something I would like to see in the future come back because uh, I think it's very important, our signage, our street striping, uh, especially crosswalks now with, with the school areas and everything. Uh, they're sorely needed. So I just hope that that stuff comes back. but. Uh, Again, it's good to be back here. Uh, good to hear the issues again. Uh, as I stated, we may have been on recess, but we have been working on, on several different issues, and uh, they'll be reported on as we go. Uh, I did attend a meeting about a week ago uh, conducted by our state representative, Marty Flynn, at Holy Rosary in North Scranton uh, for the neighbors up there of the Rockwell Avenue Bridge who were concerned about you know, the timeliness of what's going on. We do have legislation this evening uh, that we'll be introducing and hopefully be able to fast track it next week. Uh, it does appear, even with this here legislation, that that bridge probably won't, it won't be completed. I think it's a liberal schedule. Maybe with good weather next summer, it could be completed in the summer, but they're not looking at completing it until late fall, early winter next year. Um, the one advantage to the legislation that we're passing tonight to the residents of the city is, is the refinancing package for it and stuff like that. Instead of the city uh, paying 20%, our, our cut is reduced to 5%. So it's over $300,000 savings for the city. Uh, but unfortunately, it's taken so long. Uh, I don't believe... I mean, it could have been, it should have been closed long before it was. We were fortunate. That's how bad it is. But I think we're on track now, and with this legislation, it's going to advance it. Uh, we have good news that uh, possibly in the next few months, be before Christmas, um, the Linden Street Bridge will be open, West Linden Street. And the Music Street Bridge also, at least uh, two lanes one way and one lane another way, should be opened uh, within the next, I believe, month or so was, was the uh, report I was given. So we're starting to get access back 
and forth in the city. And uh, hopefully we still have other bridges to work on. And ironically, the, the bridge, the West Lock One Avenue bridge that I had reported on so frequently, that section finally collapsed. It was fortunate that they had that plywood up there. Uh, otherwise, it could have been a catastrophe. But there is a big chunk laying on the ground below. And again, fortunately, it wasn't going over the railroad tracks where it collapsed or there was a road underneath there. It, it's a dead end spot. So that was a blessing. But I do believe, uh, did I see somewhere where the bids for the engineering and stuff have, have been approved? Or it was a Shaner for the engineering? Yeah, I, I thought I, ju I just saw I that. I think for the that may be for a different project. Oh, okay. Because I, 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 I believe that was, that was up. But, but um, if Hopefully I it's could, close. Sure. Um, just one quick comment on the Rockwell Avenue Bridge. Um, Mr. Loscombe is correct in that um, the, the funding for the project will be shifting, whereas the, you know previously the federal government provided 80 percent and the city was to provide 20 percent. But now we're going to be involved in a situation where, again, the federal government will provide 80 percent but the state of Pennsylvania will provide 15% and the city will provide only 5%. Now that may create a $300,000 savings, but on the other hand, it may also create only a $40,000 savings because there was a 10-year time limit uh, set by the federal government on such projects. And the city exceeded the 10-year time limit. And as such, the city may be required to refund the federal government approximately $260,000. So that, now we're hoping that won't occur, but Correct. we must be realistic. It very well could occur. And that would drive down our savings that, that would be incurred in that shift from 20% to 5% down to more likely $40,000 in savings. And ironically, if we didn't have this shift and that happened, we'd be paying 40000 more than we originally would have. So it's, it's just, uh, you know, I don't know if they haven't taken serious over the years some of these projects. Uh, it was the same thing with our uh, our. Uh, Street lights, the uh, directional signals. We were that close to losing over $900,000. Uh, we had extensions on that, on, on the city's portion for the design work because we were right at the tail end of getting that done. And uh, I don't know why. There's just no reason for these projects to be de delayed until the 11th, sometimes the 13th hour with a little extension beyond the 11th hour. But, you know, we have to be more prudent in the future so we don't uh, lose these opportunities and, uh, you know, hurt our constituents even more. But basically, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. And Councilman Joyce, do you have comments or motions? Yes. Uh, I'll try to be as brief as possible. First, I wanted to start out tonight. Um, by thanking the uh, Scranton uh, La Festa committee on their hard work and diligence that they've put into um, this year's uh, Italian festival. I had the opportunity to volunteer with some members of the Scranton JCs down at the festival and I got to meet some members of the committee and they really do um, a great job uh, putting forth a lot of volunteer hours uh, to make that festival a success and it brings uh, a lot of people into the downtown area brings in permit revenue uh, into the city and I think overall it's a, a very beneficial part of uh, the city and it's all it also honors um, part of the city's heritage uh, secondly tonight 
I just wanted to give a brief update of where the city is as far as um, money uh, that it's received from the single tax office. Uh, as of the end of August of 2012, the city received $11,303,411.31 in real estate tax revenue. This year, the city has received $14,356,619.41 in real estate tax revenue. So that's an increase of slightly over $3 million or 27%. Now, mind you, we did have a 22% tax increase. However, we still are seeing a greater percentage of revenue coming in than the tax increase was. So that's um, a very positive note that indicates that people are uh, current on paying their taxes. Uh, delinquent real estate tax, um, as of the end of August um, 2012, the city had received 450,341.05. This year, um, at, as, as of the end of August, the city received 509,000. 349.72, that's an increase of $59,008.67, or 13.1%. Um, the uh, local service tax, uh, as of the end of August of 2012, the city received 967,987.91. As of the end of August in 2013, the city received 1,000,000. $211,063.64. This is an increase of $243,075.73, or 25.11%. Uh, business privilege and mercantile taxes. As of the end of August uh, of 2012, the city received $1,647,418.27. As of the end of August uh, this year, the city has received uh, 2,041,569.49, which is an increase of 23.93%. So overall, uh, revenue from the tax office is coming through um, very well, I would say. And I would just like to thank uh, the staff over there and Mr. Courtright for doing a good job. In other news, um, the audit. I uh, received an email over the uh, recess actually from uh, Ms. Schumacher about the audit. And I know that in the past uh, it, it was stated that the timeline, well, that the projected completion date for the audit would be in uh, June or July. And obviously that hasn't happened. Um, there are some outstanding issues. I don't think it's as bad as it was at this point last year, but um, following, uh, the following was to be provided by April 15th. Uh, the parking authority audited financial statements um, as of uh, December 31st, 2012, and we don't have this yet. And there are three open memos that Rossi and Rossi had also notified us about. Uh, the workman's compensation, cash and investments, sick pay questions follow up, and the workman compensations, uh, compensation posting. Uh, I will address this with uh, Ms. McCandra, our business administrator, and uh, hopefully report on when these memos will be um, resolved, and also when uh, a completed audit of the uh, SPA will be obtained as well. We also received some information, or, or actually a letter, that was sent to the mayor by John O'Shea, who's the president of the Composite Pension Board, and he writes, on August 28th of 2013, the pension plan actuarial Bayer Barber presented the actuarial val valuation results of the City of Scranton pension plans as of January 1st, 2013. I have included a summary page 
by Bayer Barber, which outlines the city's 2014 minimum municipal obligation, as we refer to as the MMO, and the MMO adjusted for relief under Act 44. By definition, the MMO only establishes minimum compliance with Act 205. It does not ensure the plan's solvency. It is the board's strong recommendation that the city of Scranton fund its pensions beyond the MMO before Act 44 relief. As indicated by Randy Siegel, CEO of Bayer Barber, contributions at the MMO level with Act 47 relief are not sufficient to fund the plan. Given the desperately low funding levels of the fire pension fund, which is at 17.5%, non-uniform, which is at 24.2%, and police, which is at 30.4% funded, there's a significant concern regarding the continued solvency of the plans. All of the plans professionals, including actuarial, administrative, investment, and legal, concur with the composite board recommendation to use the MMO before Act 44 relief as a baseline for the city's 2014 contribution. And as we know, there was an article in the Scranton Times regarding the increase to the MMO. And unfortunately for the city, it looks like that the city will be contributing more to fund pensions in 2014, which is an additional expense beyond 2013. And um, the Composite Pension Board recommends that we go beyond that additional expense. and. We have to uh, decide whether that's feasible or not in the whole realm of things that are being discussed, especially since Pell is saying in a worst case scenario, they're projecting or they, they would recommend a 110% tax increase. So there's many issues that have to be tackled here. There's the whole pension fund MMO issue for next year. Uh, there's revenue sources that have to be discussed for next year, such as a commuter tax. Um, there's a lot of open issues as far as uh, the Supreme Court award. I know progressions have been made on that. And I did receive an email from Gina McAndrew recently, which I will forward to everyone. And what I am in the process of doing with her is trying to set up a meeting next week uh, to discuss some of the city's cash flow issues, uh, to discuss uh, the future, and to discuss um, what we have to do to basically make it through the end of the year. And I would invite any council member who would like to come to uh, contact me if they wish to do so. But to conclude tonight, as you know, I'll be here for a few more months. And we have some pressing things on the table. We have a very large, or Pella's basically saying, we have to tax the crap out of people in the city of Scranton in order to fill an operating deficit for next year. I'm recommending that we pursue all revenue sources that we possibly could, as well as try to refinance debt. We need a commuter tax. We need to refinance debt. And we need to try to keep the tax increase as low as possible so that the city of Scranton and its residents can afford to stay here. Right now, to give you an estimate of what Pell would recommend, it would be an additional $500 expense per year, uh, a tax increase of 100 or 110%. 
it would be an extra $500 out of the average homeowner's pocket. And as you know, Scranton is a city that um, is home to many senior citizens living off of Social Security and fixed incomes, and they can't afford that. So um, my goal for the last few months while I'm still on council is to work harder than I ever have before to try to see that the tax increase for 2014 is minimized by as much as it could be. And interesting enough, you know, uh, Lee Morgan came up here tonight and made some interesting statements about the solution being in Harrisburg. And I believe that a big part of the solution is in Harrisburg. In the future, um, when I'm not on council, because obviously we know what we have to work with this year. To provide some br brief background, Harrisburg limits what we could do as far as taxes are concerned, who we could tax, um, and basically our taxation powers. Harrisburg must work to institute an increase in the sales tax to offset property taxes. I think that would be a good measure. And also, I would very much like to see Harrisburg pass legislation to allow cities to impose an impact fee for public safety in order to keep property taxes low, an impact fee that nonprofits would also pay into. So um, I would just like to say that Mr. Morgan's comments tonight ma made a lot of sense. Council is basically strapped with what they could do to keep taxes low. The solutions have to come from above us at this point. And that's, about, and that's all I have to say tonight. Thank you. Mrs. Evans, if I, if I could just, uh, on, on tonight on 5G, we, we will be authorizing the mayor and other appropriate city officials to execute and enter into an inspection services contract with Shaner Environmental to provide design and construction inspection services for the construction work for the project entitled West Lock One Avenue Bridge Improvement Project. So it looks like that's the successful uh, engineer that will be designing the bridge. Thank so you. I knew I had gotten some information on it. And it's here tonight. So thank you. Our bridges are moving forward, and that's something that we had approved several months ago uh, to be bid. Good evening. I'd like to welcome everyone back to these chambers as we begin Scranton City Council's fall session. During the August recess, as my colleague Mr. Loscombe noted, the work of the administration and city council continued. I wish to provide you with a brief update of several items of interest. First, paving program bids were opened on August 26, 2013 for the following streets in West Scranton, 7th Avenue, 50 feet from each side of the overpass in the downtown, North Washington Avenue, 100, 200, 300 blocks from Lackawanna Avenue to Mulberry Street. Lackawanna Avenue, the three and 400 blocks, uh, Penn Avenue, including the entire intersection to Washington Avenue, and Jefferson Avenue, the 600 block. In the Hills section, Clay Avenue, the 900 and 1,000 blocks from Myrtle Street to Poplar Street. Madison Avenue, the 1,000 block from Ash Street to Poplar Street, and Arthur Avenue, the 4, 500, and a portion of the 600 blocks from Mulberry Street to 230 feet north of Olive Street. In South Scranton, Meadow Avenue, the 100 and 200 blocks from Music Street to River Street. And finally, in Green Ridge, Albright Avenue, from the paved joint near Court Street across the bridge to the flood wall joint. Also, the 1300 to 1500 blocks of Albright Avenue, 
which will include the paved joint to Marion Street. Second, the Office of City Council received the engineering study of Lake Scranton Road, which was conducted by Civil Crossroads Consulting Engineers, LLC. The study determined that vehicles could use Elmhurst Boulevard rather than Lake Scranton Road and recommended that the city place weight restrictions on this residential road, among others. Therefore, in light of this engineering study, I asked Mrs. Craik to send a letter to the mayor and city solicitor Kelly, urging them to abide by the legislation legally and lawfully adopted by city council in November 2012 and post appropriate signage as soon as possible on Lake Scranton Road. And following the installation of signage, Mrs. Craik, please inform Chief Graziano that the police department would be able to enforce the city ordinance and signage. Now, granted, there were a number of other recommendations mentioned by some of my colleagues, um, including uh, a pedestrian lane or bike lane, um, paving of the street, etc. Obviously, those have not been included, or I should say the funding for such projects have not been included in the current year's budget. However, if council members are interested in pursuing those changes for that area, then that is something that they must consider when reviewing the mayor's proposed budget for the year 2014. Um, in addition, please send a letter to Chief Graziano regarding the truck ban in the Bellevue area. In his correspondence to council on January 23rd, 2013, the chief indicated that he had reviewed the 1994 traffic study conducted by Bogart Engineering and the placement of signage. And it was the opinion of the police department that the issue is enforcement related. However, residents report that truck traffic continues daily despite the presence of police cars at either the Southside Complex or St. John's Church parking lots. What is the number of citations issued to trucks and or tractor trailers traveling in the Bellevue area since January 2013? Can the few officers who are certified in weights and measures be assigned to this area on a temporary basis to enforce the truck ban and weight restrictions in order to send a message to trucking companies that Bellevue is off limits and violators will be cited. And I think uh, further, if you're sending a message in one area, it's going to apply to the others so that once the signage is posted on Lake Scranton Road, I'm sure many of the truck drivers will receive the word or the message that Scranton is serious about enforcing its uh, weight measures and its uh, truck bans in designated areas, and those who violate it will be and should be cited. Now, the problem in Bellevue has been ongoing for nearly 20 years, and it's a cave-in area, and this area needs and deserves a solution. Third, Council received a petition for permit parking on the 900 block of Prescott Avenue and forwarded it to Chief Graziano on August 27, 2013 for determination. When a response is received, it will be reported publicly. Fourth, the city finalized a contract with KKPR Marketing and Public Relations of Milford, Pennsylvania for preparation and implementation of the Market-Based Revenue Opportunities, or MBRO, program, which will be effective through June 1, 2016. Fifth, on July 29, 2013, the City of Scranton received a check for $17,000 from the University of Scranton 
for payment of false alarm billing from February through June 2013 following a motion approved by a majority of City Council to withhold permits until delinquent bills were paid by the University. Sixth, in response to a citizen's request regarding the status of United Neighborhood Community Development Corporation's revitalization project on Cedar Avenue, City Council received the following letter from Michael J. Hanley, Executive Director. The development known as Cedar 500 has been fully funded through multiple sources and will construct 30 new apartment units in the 5 and 600 blocks of Cedar Avenue, as well as the 3 and 400 blocks of Alder Street. The development has been approved by both the Planning Commission and the Zoning Board of the City of Scranton. UNCDC anticipates beginning construction on Cedar 500 in late September 2013 and completing the work within one year. In total, the development will rehabilitate three existing buildings in South Scranton and construct six new buildings. Cedar 500 is part of the greater efforts in the revitalization of South Scranton, which has seen many successes in the revival of this great neighborhood. Um, sixth, or excuse me, next, the Scranton Parking Authority is scheduled for a hearing before the tax assessor on September 11th, 2013. I don't know who will appear as the representative of the Scranton Parking Authority. The purpose of the reassessment is also muddy since the SPA, the receiver, and the city are interconnected in most, but not all, most financial matters concerning this, the SPA. Therefore, I have asked our city clerk, Mrs. Crake, to attend the hearing and report to council. Finally, I have a citizen's request. Residents request installation of stop signs on Elm Street and Broadway, where each intersects with the Heritage Trail. Pedestrians, including mothers with children in strollers, walkers, and joggers, are experiencing dangerous traffic conditions at these crosswalks. They report that drivers accelerate or swerve into the opposite lane of traffic rather than yield to pedestrians on a daily basis. Although yield signs are posted, they are inadequate to prevent an accident at these popular trail locations. Also, stop signs are located in the parking areas for trail users as they exit the lots, but there are none at the crosswalks located at Elm Street and Broadway. Please send letters to the city engineer and police chief requesting that they investigate these conditions and post stop signs at these locations if necessary. And that's it. Mrs. Heavens. Yes. I apologize, but if you'll just allow me one more. Uh, you, you touched on it and it reminded me uh, after the last meeting and when we had requested the uh, payment for the false alarms from the University of Scranton I, I just wanted to clarify something uh, a false alarm is a false alarm when we resp when, when the city responds there to rescue people from the elevators that's not chargeable that's not a false alarm they respond there for cooking incidents where toasters set off an alarm that's not a false alarm. False alarms are, are when they're called in falsely or students mischievously uh, pull a station and uh, spray fire extinguishers in the hallway, stuff mm -hmm. like that. that. That's what constituted the false alarm charges. And uh, apparently the university does have signage up there that any student caught doing that is responsible to ultimately pay it. So I don't know if they've collected on their part yet or not. But uh, I just wanted to clarify that because I think people think that every time there's an alarm up there, they're being charged for it. Uh, and that's not the case. They're, they're, they're responded quite a bit. And, and, and of course, the university is not the only place. Uh, many of our hospitals and stuff like that uh, have a number of alarms that, that come in. Some of them false, maybe a child pulling a station or whatever. In the hospitals, uh, alarms go off when they're doing a spray treatment or breathing treatment for a patient. 
That's not a false alarm. It activated the alarm because of a, a substance, but uh, there is a, a distinct difference. So I just wanted to clarify that because a few people have asked me. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, that reminded me of just one more brief update. I spoke with the mayor today about the delinquent garbage fees, and he indicated that additional time was provided to uh, those who owe delinquencies to make payment, which is why it has not yet been advertised in the newspaper. However, uh, the administration is hoping that these delinquencies will be advertised next week as a separate section in the Scranton Times since the number of delinquencies are so lengthy. The mayor has indicated that it can be as much as 10 to 11 pages worth. And so uh, certainly we are hoping that these delinquencies are collected as soon as possible. And uh, the mayor also stated that um, there's a concerted effort, and I think Councilman McGough discussed this at a previous meeting, concerted effort involving the 10 largest offenders. And uh, should they not all make payment in full, they will be pursued and there will be repercussions. And that's it. 5B, approving and accepting the updated City of Scranton capital budget for the year 2014, the first year revision and extension of the 2013 five-year plan. At this time, I'll entertain a motion that item 5B be introduced into its proper committee. So moved. Second. On the question. All those in favor of introduction, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it and so moved. 5C, creating and establishing a new account for the City of Scranton's Office of Economic and Community Development titled Pennsylvania DCD Housing and Redevelopment Assistance Program, revolving loan funds account number 19A0101 for the receipt and disbursement of grant funds. DCD HRA grant funds received from the Scranton Connell LLC. At this time, I'll entertain a motion that item 5C be introduced into its proper committee. So moved. Second. On the question, I believe it is wise to set up a, a separate account uh, for this particular matter. Uh, if everyone remembers, proceeds received by the city from uh, the Scranton Connell LLC must be used for loans for businesses. That's what's considered the first round of repayment. When you enter the second round of repayment, which would be those businesses repaying the city for the loans they would receive as a result of the proceeds of Scranton Connell, that second round is what is categorized as re-refunds, and they can be used for any purpose within the city of Scranton. So I think this is appropriate. It's wise to set up the account, keep it separate, and to keep it utilized for HUD's designated purpose, which is loans to businesses. All those in favor of introduction signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it and so moved. 5D, authorizing the mayor and other appropriate city officials to execute and enter into a supplemental reimbursement agreement number 041222-D with the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania for the purpose of increasing and reallocating the funds allocated for design, right of way, utility costs, and construction funding for the Rockwell Avenue Bridge project. At this time, I'll entertain a motion that item 5D be introduced into its proper committee. So moved. Second. On the question? Yes, I'd just like to make a brief comment. I'd like to thank um, Representative Flynn and, and of course, uh, Councilman Loscombe. Um, I was unable to attend the meeting that night, but I did have a, a good discussion with um, Representative Flynn. Boy, 10 minutes after the meeting, we were on the phone discussing this. and. The residents of North Scranton have waited far too long for this bridge. And 
uh, being a resident of Westside, I know for sure what it's like to be without a bridge. Um, we had a couple, the Crisp Avenue, Crisp which Avenue. we fought hard to, to have re, uh, reopen, and we have a couple more that we're working uh, with PennDOT now. So we look forward to uh, have this project completed for the residents of North Scranton. And I know that uh, Councilman Lawson and I, during motions, uh, discussed at length uh, what is behind this legislation in terms of the Rockwell Avenue Bridge project. But just to reiterate the, the uh, one item, the reason for this legislation is the fact that the city exceeded the 10-year uh, limit for federal funding. And within that 10-year ten, ten limit, um, the federal government is expecting the municipality to progress from design through construction and right-of-way. And that did not occur. So uh, PennDOT is now in the process of getting the project refunded for the right-of-way and construction. And by doing so, that will change that uh, funding formula for which the city is responsible. And just to add one thing, I know Jack or Mr. Loscom, you mentioned under motions about possibly moving it up. I think that would be a, something that would be great if we could do it in two readings yes, um, no. next week. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, it's only a resolution. So oh, there will only so be we two can. readings. Excellent. And next week will be the final. Um, all those in favor of introduction, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it and so move. 5E, accepting a donation of $100 from Anthracite Heritage Museum and Iron Furnaces Associates, presented to the City of Scranton Fire Department. At this time, I'll entertain a motion that item 5E be introduced into its proper committee. So moved. Second. On the question? Uh, this money is being donated to the fire department in appreciation for their assistance in numerous community gatherings. All those in favor of introduction signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it and so moved. 5F, authorizing the mayor and other appropriate city officials to execute and enter into a memorandum of, under of agreement that the City of Scranton will cooperate with Lackawanna County in preparing the five-year update of the 2009 Bi-County Hazard Mitigation Plan and appoint City Planner Don Kane as our municipal representative. At this time, I'll entertain a motion that item 5F be introduced into its proper committee. So moved. Second. On the question, um, the county received both federal and state funding to update the plan, so there will be no cost to the city of Scranton. And participation relieves the city from having to pre prepare its own individual plan at its own expense. And so um, by joining in this, it keeps the city eligible for disaster funding, and uh, I believe that the entire process will take 18 months and conclude in late 2014. All those in favor of introduction signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it and so moved. 5G, authorizing the mayor and other appropriate city officials to execute and enter into an inspection services contract with the Shaner Environmental to provide design and construction inspection services for the construction work for the project entitled West Lackawanna Avenue Bridge Improvement Project. At this time, I'll entertain a motion that item 5G be introduced into its proper committee. So moved. Second. And the question? Um, this contract is for $89,600 and it is funded through HUD and the funding was applied for by OECD. The contract remains in effect through December 31st, 2014 and RFPs were issued by the city. All those in favor of introduction signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it and so moved. Sixth order, no business at this time. <coughs> Seventh order, no business at this time. If no one has any further business, 
I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. This meeting is adjourned. <laughs>